Hey everybody, welcome to Camel City Chat. I'm your host, John McPherson, and I am here with someone that I have known about, that we've crossed paths a couple of times, but I've never had the opportunity to sit down and chat with them, and I'm really, really excited because I want to learn about a couple of things that I have just a, a, just a scratch on the surface knowledge of, um, and uh, it's none other than, than the man, the myth, the legend, Nigel Austin, um, just a great guy. Uh, turns out we have some friends that you've been friends with for like 20 or 30 years that that you know you didn't know that I had known, and I guess I need to tell you the story that I promised I'd tell you. Well, Nigel, you're in trouble now. You know people that I know for twenty or thirty years. Uh, you found out some things. I'm talking about the hipster, but I didn't. I didn't call him up, so don't worry. All so right. one of my fraternity brothers obviously works with works with you at uh, uh, Dale Carnegie, and we're going to get into that. But <laughs> you and I have something in common. We both outpunted our coverage. <laughs> you have a beautiful wife. I have a beautiful wife. My wife, one entire time in her lifetime, has written to an editorial page to compliment the author. Is that so? My wife, Catherine, wrote you a letter probably three or four years into our marriage. She worked at the hospital. She loved your point of view and just wrote you a note. And you were so kind. You wrote her back and said, thank you so much for the compliment. And uh, I was walking out here tonight and she says, who are you interviewing again? And I told her and she goes, that's that nice man that wrote the, that I used to always read his editorials. Don't you remember me writing him? And I go, what are you talking about? But you have just a, a way with words. And, you know, I, I feel like people think I slurp up on my guests, but I mean, it is truly, uh, you do so much for the community that I think a lot of people don't have a clue that you do. And that's what I want to do today is talk to you about those things and talk to you about our city that we both love. All right. Before we get there, you know what they are. We've got three questions for you, buddy. Fire away. The first one, where are you from and how long you been in Winston? Well, I am 68 years old. I will be 69 in November. I am from here, lifelong resident, been here all of my life and went to college at Livingstone in Salisbury, came back home, didn't plan on it, been here ever since. So this is my home, uh, born and reared here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And your wife, you met freshman year in Livingstone? Uh, we met on November 14th, 1970, <clears throat> the okay. first semester of our freshman year at Livingstone College. And uh, we dated uh, all through our college. We were engaged for three and a half years. After that, uh, we got married about three years after we graduated, lived apart for the first three and a half years. We, she worked in Greenville, South that's, Carolina. That's why you're still married, right? <laughs> You know, they say, after, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder or yonder. So right. for us, it was the fonder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you're a man of faith. I, I, I love that about you. Um, you have a very strong faith. Um, and I want to get into that. Um, but the second question, and this is where we get in trouble. What's your favorite restaurant? Well, there's so many favorite restaurants. So it depends on a given day. Uh, All right. Right. Prior to coronavirus, so probably three to four times a week for lunch, you would see me at West End Cafe. And if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you will see pictures of food from lunch there. Curry so, chicken salad. I love that curry chicken salad. Oh, yep. So it's, uh, it's all good. So there's so many places, but that's, that's one of them. Sweet potatoes is always outstanding. Another Walking great out one. Food Shack is always outstanding. Uh, they're just, uh, so wherever there's good food, we go. All right. Are you doing any takeout? Uh, we're doing, we have done some takeout. Um, there is a person who was cooking for a friend of ours and she has taken us on. So three to four times a week, uh, she cooks and she actually delivers it. And uh, we have meals during the week. So there hasn't been as much takeout because it's being brought in and, so uh, you want to share that number with me when we get done? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll hold out a little bit on that one. All right. Let's, so you live you know, downtown, don't you? No, I'm out in the uh, west side of town near Jefferson Elementary School. Okay. All right. Well, see, I had thought that you lived downtown because I have a question for you about a bench. Yes. And you have an office that I need to ask you about. That's the other thing that I told I get to. I told you. All right. So the third thing is, is what do you love to do in Winston, which may be the bench, but... Yeah. Well, you know, you, you, the good thing about this is that you told me beforehand there are three questions, and I thought about that third question, and I have two answers for you, one of which is the bench. Okay. So, uh, 
right on the corner of Fourth and Cherry, I believe it is, where the United Way used to be, the Village Juice Shop is there now. There was a bench right there facing Fourth Street. And so any Thursday, Friday, or Saturday evening, my wife and I would be sitting on that bench. That was our fr front porch. Right. So we would sit there. I would have a cigar. Uh, we just wave at people going by, uh, check the people walking up down the street, and have a great time. So that, that I would say, is uh, you've really done your homework. I'm, I'm impressed. I, I got something to throw back at you, though. That also has a significance in my life. How was that? I met my wife in that building. Wow. Yep. How you like that? See, we're crossing some paths here. I didn't, and you got out Livingston and I didn't even make, uh, I didn't even make fun of it. I mean, you know what the, or you let Orlando Mitchell goes there. Yeah. I can't believe you graduated from there and let him go there. Well, now see now one thing that he would correct you on and I will too is Livingstone. Stone. I know. I'm sorry. You I apologize. To, if you talk to someone from Livingstone and you say Livingston, they mm -hmm. will correct you in a moment. So, well, and you know where I went to college? Appalachian, not Appalachian. So I apologize on that. I should have done better. I but understand. so, um, what about what's the other favorite thing to do in Winston? Well, CG Hill Memorial Park is a favorite place we like to go to. We actually went out there a couple of days ago, and you know it's great. Uh, it's serene. Uh, there are not a lot of people. Picnic tables. You can sit, watch, enjoy, and just have a great time. And so, being there is a place we like to just ride out on a. Saturday or Sunday afternoon, particularly when the weather is pretty and just hang out. Now, have you been inside the tree? Have not. All right. I took my daughter in the tree. We, we sure like it out there. Um, you know, it's cool because I feel that CG is almost two parks in one. You've got the lower, the, you know, with the pond and it's, it's sheltered in and right. then you go up and they've, and they've done the walkway up top and stuff. And it's, you know, you're out in the middle of a grassy field almost in a sense. So I just found out about the upper level this past week. I didn't know that existed. Yep, yep. It's a, um, it is a, it's a great park. And and we, you know, I've got a five year old, so we we always try to find the different parks. I'll tell you, with where you are, you ought to go down there and park uh, at the bottom of the hill on Robin Hood and walk. Um, you can walk all the way to Peace Haven at. Um, yep, uh, you can go all the way down to Meadow uh, Meadow Lock School and Elvin. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. down there. That's hat. That's a. Uh, Oh gosh, I can't remember what the name of that park is, but we like that park. Muddy well. Creek. Thanks. It's a Muddy Creek Greenway, but there's a park that's on it too, and yeah. it's um, uh, you know, it's right, right down the, the street from it. So we have a pathway that goes right into the to the strollway. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about we're talk. I want to get into the faith thing because I know that you are a motivational speaker and stuff like that. Correct. Um, you have a very strong faith. Correct. Where, where do you go to church? I attend United uh, Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church. I grew up at St. James AME Church, right. which is on the corner of 15th from Patterson. I uh, moved from there probably about 10 years ago and joined United Metropolitan. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, uh, there's some, we've got some great churches in our, in our town, and I, I just didn't know which one that you went to. I want to ask you about that. You, um, uh, you did Dale Carnegie. What... Dale Carnegie is something that has always intrigued me. Of course, you know, when we were talking about this ahead of time, I was like, oh, that, I didn't know that was still on. So how did you get into Dale Carnegie way back in the day? So I took the course in 1989. Uh, prior to that time, I had read his book, which is a second bestseller to the Bible, How to Win Friends and Influence People. So I was familiar with the book. Uh, there was a friend of mine or a colleague at Intergon, which is where I work, which is now GMAC Insurance. Right. And you would have to know him, I won't say his name, to, to know his personality. And what I saw one day, he was a very assertive, somewhat arrogant, if you will, person. And um, I noticed something changed about him, but I didn't know. I knew something happened, but I didn't know what. Right. Now, one day I asked him, I said, so something's changed about the way. So I'm taking a Dale Carnegie course. And I'm like, wow. Now, if that could have an impact on you like that. I need to check that course out. And of course, different people take it for different reasons in terms of what they want to gain out of it. So in 89, I took the course. Uh, once I uh, completed it, it was a 14-week course at that time. I became a graduate assistant for the next two years, primarily because that was my discipline to continue to have to apply what I learned in the course. Uh, after that two-year period of time, I was invited to become an instructor, went through the process, 
1992 became certified and have been doing it for the last 28 years now. Right. All right. So, and you, uh, obviously with, with COVID, it's a little different, but you do teach classes over in Greensboro. In Greensboro. We, we used to have some here in Winston-Salem, but uh, predominantly they are in Greensboro. Uh, there are some in-house classes or in-company classes that I've done in other locations other than Greensboro, and we're doing more digital classes now. As a matter of fact, I uh, co-facilitated one yesterday and have another one tomorrow morning. So because of what's happening now, uh, we're delivering more virtual training uh, versus uh, face-to-face type training. And how do you feel that is doing with regards to impacting the student? Well, the, the impact is the same. It's just a matter of using technology and the tools in a way that replicates what you do in the classroom. So, for example, you are now, now are doing this via Zoom. Uh, when we do the virtual class, it's by WebEx. Right. In a class, I might tell you to join another person and have a conversation with them, or I can ask you a question, ask people to raise their hand. When you're doing it virtually, you're using other tools. And so you would click on an icon and say, if you have a question, raise your hand. There's an icon that raises the hand. Right. And then I might say, okay, John, you raise your hand. What question do you have? Right. Now, there's a whiteboard where you can write information or a chat box where you can put information. So the experience is similar. It's just using different tools uh, to do the same thing that you might do face-to-face. Okay. How long is the program now? Uh, the, the Dale course is still the same length. Uh, it's, well, it was 14 weeks. Uh, we moved that back to 12, and we also have an eight-week. So it's either an eight-week course or a 12-week course. Mm-hmm. Most of the webinars that we're doing now are two-hour courses. Right. Versus an eight week, even though we have some of those that we can offer as well. Now, my understanding in the last bit of research I did for you is, is you did work at GMAC. And were you like a community relations person there? What was your position? So I started working at GMAC on May 28th, 1974, two weeks after I graduated. I worked there for 35 years and nine months. Exactly. I started out in our life insurance company as an underwriter, worked in there for uh, about 14 to 15 years, moved into a marketing area, managed a new business area. The last 20 years, I was part of human resources and was director of employee community relations. So my role had to do with engaging employees in various things, also being the liaison to the community for the company, uh, the managing trustee of our foundation. And so that brought me in contact with a lot of people serving on a lot of boards and commissions, being engaged in the community, getting our employees engaged, uh, running various campaigns like the Arts Council and United Way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think that what a lot of people don't know about you is how much you have become through your, you know, Nigel D. Austin and Associates and everything like that, a facilitator and, and things like that. You, you recently have served... Um, the city's called on you to fill in positions for as they're doing searches and things like that, haven't they? That is correct. Um, about six years ago, I guess, when the Department of Social Services uh, was in the process of replacing a director of the department, I was called upon by the county manager to step in for a three-month stint as the interim director of the Department of Social Services while they conducted the search. Uh, great experience, uh, learned a lot in the process. It was a short time, but um, I developed some great relationships during that time as well. You know, when Jack Dudley calls, you pick up the phone and you say yes, don't you? He's a good guy. I, I, I think the world of him. I need to have him on the show. Um, the last time I talked to him, he was, I think he was at some seminar in, in D.C. and we were going to get together and then all, all this broke through. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah, we've got, I, I tell you, um, I think we've got some great leaders and I'm glad that they're smart enough to realize, you know, who to ask and, and to get things done. How was that experience for you? It was a great experience. You know, it was short term. It was three months. So it's not so much to do. It's ensuring that you uh, challenge people, uh, you communicate well with them, you let them know that you can manage through this particular time. But it was a growth experience for me. It was leading an organization. I had some experience with them because I served on the board of DSS for six years and was chair of that board for five of those six years. So I had some knowledge of it, knew something about the people, just a manager of communicating and uh, keeping everything going while they went through the process of selecting a new person. Right. Yeah. We, um, I had on one of the ladies from, uh, the family, uh, 
she, she does a lot of the searches for the um, foster parents and stuff like that. Right. Um, and she was on a radio show and just had a real nice time talking with her. Um, how'd you get into writing this? That is something I'd love to do. And I, I, I think I, I don't have the patience with myself to do it. How, how did you get into well, it? Cause you write two columns a month, don't you? Well, currently I'm not writing and haven't for the last couple of years, primarily because my wife has had some, chronic pain that she's been dealing with, I hadn't had the time, but interesting story in terms of how it started. I don't know if you know or knew Nat Irvin. Uh, Nat uh, was at Wake Forest. He also worked at Winston-Salem State in Advancement at one time. He started writing with the Chronicle and also wrote for the Winston-Salem Journal. Nat's a very dear friend of mine. We were having a conversation one day. Uh, One, I never thought of myself as a writer. I never wrote. I didn't have a column. I didn't study that in school. So that's, that wasn't in my uh, area of expertise or something I even thought about doing. <clears throat> like you and I having a conversation, uh, Nat and I would be talking and I might say, you know, Nat, I met this guy named John. I think you ought to write a column about it. So why don't you do it? And I'm thinking, I don't have a column. You do. I don't write. You do. And so I would just brush it off. It might be a month or two months. And I would say, Nat, you know, I met this interesting person today, and they're doing so and so and so. I think that'd be a good column. I say, why don't you do it? I'm like, dude, so I'm just going to stop telling you this. Because mm-hmm. every time I tell you, you say, why don't you do it? Well, one day, back in, I want to say it was 1994, I finally got the nerve to say, okay, I'll try it. I don't know what Nat sees, why he thinks I can do it, but I'm going to do it. So he gave me some advice. So there are three things you need to know. First of all, you need to start with an A paragraph because that's what grabs a person's attention and keeps them interested. I'm taking notes. Two, you need to write about or write for yourself. It's not for anyone else, whether anyone else likes it or not. You're not writing to please anyone. You write for yourself. And number three, eventually you will find your voice. I said, Nat, what is your voice? You say, you'll know it when you find it. I'm like, please help me out here. You tell me, I know when I find it, but you won't tell me what it is, and I have no clue. And so the very first column I wrote, I actually wrote it by longhand. I didn't know that the newspapers actually determine what the heading is gonna be. So I would come up with my own heading. I wrote it out by longhand, then I typed it on the typewriter, and I sent it to Nat because I wanted him to read it first to give me some feedback. Oh, I know what he did. And I didn't hear from him. Mm-hmm. And I, at that time, I had talked to Ernie Pitt, who was the publisher and owner of the Chronicle, and he said he would give me the space. It was going to be for free. So I waited a day. I didn't hear from that. I waited another day. He's I did hear friend. From yep. And so now it's time that you have to send it in. I send it in. So when it comes out in the paper on that Thursday, right. Nat sends me a copy of it. And he circles, this is your eight paragraph which was like five or six paragraphs. I'm thinking, so why didn't you tell me that? Before I, <laughs> I thought it? he would have sent it in for you, so this is even better. Yep. He, uh, and, and part of the point of that was he was helping me to see what the A paragraph was. And, and obviously, the more you do it, you begin to understand, okay, this is the one that's the most important one to start with that get, grabs the attention and keeps the person reading in it. Correct. Probably four years five years after that, that literally one day I was sitting down and all of a sudden it went, that's my voice. It just, it finally hit me, that's it. My voice is who I am, what I write about. So if I wrote something or you wrote something and my picture was in the paper and name and someone read it, they would likely say, that doesn't sound like you. Right just because of my style, usually I'm writing about personal interest type or human interest type stories or motivational, right. inspirational stories. Very unlikely of me to write something that's really controversial or political. Every once in a while, there's something that sort of ticks me off and I might write about it. But generally speaking, um, I know what my voice is and that's what comes across. And so that, that really came true. And so for, 20, 25 years or so, um, I started out with the Chronicle. When Nat left the Winston-Salem Journal, I moved over there. So I was writing weekly. I had started off on a Wednesday. I was still working for GMAC at the time. 
So it's a very fine line of working and writing and appearing in the paper. It moved from Wednesday to Sunday, and so it was every Sunday for a while, and then it moved from Sunday to Saturday, and uh, ended up on Saturday about three years ago. Mm-hmm. You miss it? I do miss it. It's, uh, part of it is, you know, and I usually write late at night. Normally it would be for an article, for a column on Saturday, it would have to be in on Wednesday morning sometimes. So usually 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock on Tuesday. It's sort of when I sit down and, and actually start to write. Procrastinate? Well, that's when it comes to me. I, I do okay. it when I feel it, when I have an idea about something, you know, it takes two or three hours and I just sit there and play with it and move around. I do miss it. it and again, part of the challenge now with my wife having uh, been dealing with some chronic pain and some issues, just having the time to focus and sit down and, and stay with it. That's the challenge part, and that's why I haven't been able to do it. But I do miss it. I, I miss, you know, like your wife sending in a note. Uh, anytime anyone wrote me, I always wrote them back and thanked them. Uh, you know, someone takes the time. I, I learned that from Nito Cobain a number of years ago. I was on an airplane once, and I was reading uh, an article in the magazine, and it was talking about Nito and about a book he had written. It sounded interesting. I uh, found out he lived in High Point, so I called his office. To say I wanted to come over and purchase a book. It was on a Saturday. I'll never forget. I went over, and when I went in, uh, they brought him out from the back. He said, well, come over. Let me take you around. He'd never met me before. Took me through the office, showed me all around, gave me a copy of the book, autographed it, gave me some additional motivational tapes, which I listened to. My question to him was, I just came to buy the book. Why did you take me around the office and give me these things? So well, you took the time to come over. So... I think it's only appropriate that I give you those things. So it's it's important to, when someone acknowledges something or takes the time to send you an email to write back to say, John, thank you. I appreciate it. You know, as I deal with your wife, I appreciate your kind of words. And so you develop that kind of a connection with people who, who read it, who cut it out, who quote something, or there's something that you said that touches them in a way at that particular moment that they're going through that might resonate with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it, I try every day to do better on that stuff. It's uh, just writing a thank you note and things like that. It just seems that we get so far ahead. We, we moved and, and one of our neighbors brought us over some flowers yesterday. Right. And, I, my, and, I, and I wrote him a thank you note. And another one brought us something today and I'm going to write him a thank you note. And I'm, right. I'm really trying to do better on that. When I got sworn in as the um, realtor's president, everyone that got up and talked talked about my birthday cards. And, you know, I've gotten so far behind on my birthday cards. The stack is this tall, probably. And I, um, I'm like writing birthday cards from August of last year that I'd just gotten behind on. Right. But that was one of the things they just, you know, I love, I, I can't wait to get your birthday card because I put a dollar scratch off in it. Right. But that's the way that they remember me. And now it's like, well, gosh, I got to get caught back up on that. That's people th- find that to be important. Well, you know, it's that personal touch. You know, the, the master of doing that is Claudette Weston. Okay. Claudette probably has written more notes of appreciation and just saying, I love you. You're a great person, you know, clipping something in the newspaper or just sending a car for no reason all across this community. And to your point, there are people who miss that because that's a personal touch from you right? that they look for and they can identify with. And when they see you, it brings back that same feeling. Well, and I, I believe Claudette used to come and buy books from us out at uh, Piedmont News. And uh, I think she has a daughter and the two of them would come out and pick up books. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I remember meeting them out there, but uh, yeah, just, um, you know, it's just, it, we live in such a great community. Yes, we do. And, and now, now the big one. All so right. you got this little part-time job. I mean, you're lazy. You only do it every other year or something like that. What's well, I'm, I'm of course kidding with you, but tell me, for, for, for someone that has never even been, let's say, or even knows anything about this, you know, so there's a person out there that, that doesn't know anything about the National Black Theater Festival. Mm-hmm. Paint the picture for them so that we can share with them and, and understand. And, and thank goodness that this is an off year, right? Because, because hopefully we'll have everything back to normal next year. I, I'm, I'm, so what is the National Black Theater Festival and why Winston-Salem? So... Why Winston-Salem is because that's where the North Carolina Black Repertory Company is. So North Carolina Black Rep is the first and the oldest black 
professional black repertory company in the state of North Carolina. So it was founded by Larry Leon Hamlin in 1979. Right. Well, the reason it's here is because the company was here and Larry was here, and that's why it started here. So if you can imagine for those, if you have not attended, never having had one before, and in 1989, you have this grand idea that I'm going to pull uh, all these professionals from across the country and international to come to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and we're going to pull off a festival. <clears throat> Now, the benefit of that, uh, and aside to that, is my wife and I uh, have been patrons of the North Carolina Black Rep from the beginning, but we had vacation planned for that weekend already, and we're going on a cruise. Right. Now, think about this. We've never had a festival before, so you don't know what's going to happen. We have vacation planned. We go on vacation. We come back, and you read all this great reviews in the newspaper. The New York Times had featured it. 10,000 people came. Uh, Maya Angelou signed on and became the first co-chair. Right. She brought some of her friends, one of whom was Oprah Winfrey, who brought others. And that started the first National Black Theater Festival. Since that time, for those who haven't been, uh, last year, for example, we had more than 30 professional companies, including uh, three colleges and universities. Uh, we had over 130 performances over a seven-day period of time in multiple venues throughout the community. So it's Reynolds Auditorium, it's the North Carolina School of the Arts, it's the Stevens Center, it's Wake Forest, it's Winston-Salem State University, it's Summit School, it's in both of the hotels. We have more than 60,000 people to come into the community. Hotels are booked up completely. Restaurants are doing fantastic. Uh, the city is a partner, the county is a partner, we have a number of sponsors. And so you just have this, um, this great energy and enthusiasm over that seven day period of time. It kicks off with a gala on that Monday night and it ends on that Saturday evening with a parade downtown. So it's, it's great performances, they're one person performances, they're complete theater companies that are performing, it's all over the community. There are musicals, as well as dramas, as well as uh, historical pieces. It's just a great time in our community. Uh, if you love theater and enjoy being around people and having a good time, and what we say it is a international celebration and on holy ground. This is what we call Black Holy Ground, once in Salem, North Carolina. So people are already inquiring about the dates for 2021. Uh, last year, for example, uh, well, in November of 2018, people were beginning to make reservations for the end of July 2019. By early February or March, one of the host hotels was already completely sold out. You're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to $11 million economic impact to the community, not including our ticket sales. So it's just a, it's, it's a vibrant time, it's energetic time, there's a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, it's just a great week. Okay. Now, you, I, I think my favorite part is, is kind of like the workshops or the, or the chats in a sense where, you know, you take a, a professional um, uh, and, and that person tells you about their craft and what's motivated them and where they get their inspiration and stuff like that. And, and, and you just boil it down to who the individual is. Um, I know you've had some, uh, you know, you've been involved since the beginning, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, who have been some of those people? I, my wife said, you know, it, it, um, is it Malcolm Jamal Warner? She remembers him coming and stuff. But who have been some of the people that you've really been excited about that have been there? To be honest with you, John, I'm excited every time it comes. Right. Regardless of whom the it's person like, It's like a week of Christmas, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, it's such a, a such a great time, whether it's Oprah Winfrey, whether it's uh, Hal Johnson, who's been here before, Malcolm Jamal Warner was here uh, and sort of co-chaired our Midnight Poetry Jam at that particular time. It's, it's just, it's such a great time, just all of it. You, you mentioned about some of the chats. So we have, there really are many festivals within the festival. Um, and there's a lot of it that is free. So we do, as you indicate, we have workshops during the day. So if you are interested in theater or you want to come to a stage reading 
or want to learn from some of those who are experts in their field, you have the opportunity to do that and it's free. Uh, we have stage readings late at night. We have midnight poetry jam uh, late in the evening uh, for a different crowd that usually comes out for it. There are performances that are every day, usually starting at three o'clock and eight o'clock. Uh, we also have what we call Teen Tastic, which focuses on the teens. And so we have workshops for them that are led by celebrities. We have activities for them at the fairgrounds. Uh, we also have an event. We moved it to Corporate Plaza this year on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, where we have multiple bands that come out. And so people can come out uh, to that for free. So there, there are so many things within the festival that's going on that anyone can find something they like. This year for the first time or last year, uh, we had an outdoor performance of Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare, and the setting was Jamaica. So it was Jamaican Shakespeare outside in the park uh, beside the Arts Council Theater, which was completely different, and it was free. So there's, there's just there's something for everyone uh, if you love theater, whether you're young or old, uh, whether you want to become educated or not. There are press conferences every day, so you get a chance to meet the celebrities. There are after parties uh, every evening, receptions, uh, where you can come in if you've gone to a performance and meet some of the celebrities. And they're just everyday people, and they, they walk around, and they go to the performances like everyone else and hang out. So it's, it's a great time. Well, how did you become executive director? So the and show, I'm waiting to hear this story. It's like, were you voluntold, or, or you didn't show up to that meeting that day? Well, the short version of that, again, my wife and I have been involved with it since 79 as patrons and being involved. Uh, in 1992, Ben Ruffin, the late Ben Ruffin, who worked for uh, R.J. Reynolds, now Reynolds American, was the chair of the fundraising committee, and Ben asked me to be a part of that committee. So I've been a part of the fundraising committee since 92. For the last five or six festivals, I've been the co-chair of that, along with the mayor of the city. So that started um, my stint with that. There was a short period of time where I served on the board many years ago. Uh, after Larry passed, we had an interim director. Uh, after a search, a permanent director was hired. Uh, that didn't quite work out. There were need for someone to step in. Uh, I know something about it. I know the people. I've been engaged with it. I helped raise funds for it. Someone on the board mentioned me. They called and said, well, you know, what do you think about just coming in and being an interim? And my question was, so how long is that? Uh, what plans do you have in terms of hiring someone? Well, we'll, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. So we'll talk about it. How long have you been interim director? <laughs> well, I was interim beginning uh, actually on my birthday, November 3rd, 2015. And probably a year after that became the, the interim title was taken off. So I became the director. And over the last probably year, I've just changed that from full time to part time. So I'm still executive director. It started as interim. We took the interim off and now it's part time uh, executive director. Now, will it be part time once the once the is it part time just because we're on an off year? No, I mean, it's it's part time. And I mean, I'm. Literally, I'm working all the time, but I'm just not in the office every single day. Right. So, but it, it doesn't change whether it's a festival year or not a festival year. Right now, the, the committee to raise funds for the festival started after the festival last year, and we've been meeting once a quarter, and we'll pick that up to monthly beginning in January. So that's an ongoing process, and at the same time, there's still things with the company that are going on. For example, we have a board meeting tomorrow night, so tomorrow we'll be doing what you and I are doing now is having a Zoom board meeting. Right. Uh, to just talk about the impact of COVID and some things that we're doing. We've had to move around some performances that we had scheduled and we've been doing some things live uh, online <clears throat> to stay in contact with folks. So it's, it's, uh, it's an all the time proposition, even though I'm not there every day. Well, I, I want to ask you about the, the bench again. I want to go back out there because um, I, we moved here in 77. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I used to deliver newspapers downtown with my brother on Sunday, New York times. And we had two stops. We dropped off, uh, at the Winston tower and at, um, oh, you've mentioned, uh, West end cafe. So that was when rainbow was over there behind, uh, mm -hmm. Shovers. Mm -hmm. Right. Now. Yeah. And, um, 
what a change. And that's, that's one of, one of my questions I want to ask. And by the way, we you know, we, we got a few more questions back. I mean, I, I haven't seen the signature cigar come out yet. I'm, 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 is this going to happen or it's okay, good. All right. I was going to say, but so <laughs> what, tell me about Winston Salem. I mean, you, you never thought you would be living here all of your life. Um, you know, you said you moved back here and, and, and you've had so many blessings here, uh, you know, uh, with your job and with the, you know, the theater festival and all that kind of stuff. Tell me about when you're sitting on that bench, what you and your wife look at and smile about and, and how much it's changed since your first time walking downtown. Okay. We just had a little bit of instability with the internet there. So okay. could you repeat that question again to tell you about Winston-Salem? I said, tell me about Winston-Salem and what you and your wife sit on that bench and smile about. It's on. Uh, it's a beautiful evening. It's uh, seeing people ride by as someone stopping at the light that you know and waving and haven't done that many times before. It's just uh, enjoying the company of each other. Uh, seeing people move up and down the street. You know, you said you came in 77. So I started at Intergarden in 74. So I've seen downtown that was very, I, first of all, I grew up here. So there was a downtown and an uptown. <clears throat> Downtown is down below the tracks where the coffee shop is. It's primarily black. So Up Frankie's time, down. Frankie's on down was downtown. So your right. barber shops, uh, black movie theaters, restaurants, et cetera, you had Uptown. So you had Bocock Stroud, where I worked when I was at high school. Uh, that building does, does not exist. So if you aren't from here and don't know anything ab about that, when you get to Fourth and Spruce or Fourth and Poplar, you just see an empty space because they've torn down the Intergon building. You have no idea that Bocock Stroud was on the corner and there was a jewelry store. store Are there J.C. Penney's downtown? There was a J.C. Penney's, there was a Davis Department store, there was Tall Hammers, there was Frank A. Stitt. Uh, where Wachovia is down in the West End, uh, that used to be Sears. Yeah. Uh, which we used to go in there and get At football. Four and a half street. Yep. Football, uh, hot dogs. And so it's uh, having work downtown in the heyday when so many of major businesses were still here and it was thriving and then we went through that period of time where businesses were leaving westinghouse was gone uh you know wells fargo well not wells fargo uh the bank buys wachovia and the headquarters moves and reynolds is purchased and the headquarters moves someplace else and downtown really was just a shell basically it was just people working and when you left at five o'clock there was no downtown and Come you, five fifteen. There's nobody downtown. There's no other downtown. So you know you have this master plan. We've heard it before. For me, one day I remember going outside and noticing that the sidewalks had been widened. There were a few more restaurants. They were serving outside, and there were flowers growing. And all of a sudden, it was okay. There's some change. You know. Then you begin to see more restaurants coming. Uh, more people coming downtown. You have the baseball stadium that's then built downtown, so more people are coming. Um, you had 4th Street Jazz, which is now in Corpening Plaza. Right. Was at the corner of Poplar and 4th Street behind the Intergon building. I remember and that, yeah. That was still bringing people downtown. And then you start having uh, some housing downtown, so now more people are moving downtown. So there's, there's been quite a transformation in terms of the city from this bustling city at one time to no one downtown and being dead to now bringing everyone back. And of course, now we have a crisis that sort of changed all of that. So those are, are things that I've been excited about and have been here long enough to see some of that happening. At the same time, we have some challenges that we still have to work through uh, through the community, but there are quite a few positive things as well. You know, um I think I said this to Pam. I went to the Love Out Loud. Uh, Lou Baldwin invited me to Love Out Loud, and I had a wonderful time there. Um, a comment was made that if you're born poor in Winston-Salem, you're going to die poor in Winston-Salem. How, how do we how do we fix that? Well, one is that uh, people... So here's, here's my personal opinion about that. One of the challenges I think we have is we don't really know each other because we haven't taken the time to sit down and have conversations with each other. Um, I know you because I'm, I, I see you here. I know you've interviewed someone who's very close to me. I know a little bit about you, but I really don't know you. Mm -hmm. Really have that kind of conversation. To do that, we have to sit down more than once. Uh, for me, a relationship is just a function of contact over time. 
the more contact you and I have over time, it's not a matter of whether we will or not, we will have and form a relationship. It then depends on the quality of them. Because we don't really have those relationships, it's difficult for us to have the conversations that are meaningful that can actually make a difference in the community. So if someone is coming into downtown and going back to the West End, they never know what's happening in the east side of Winston-Salem. Right. So if you look at the east side of Winston-Salem, there's only one grocery store. One in East Winston, and that's Food Line on Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King right across from, um, and then yeah. Zest, right there at Zesto's mm -hmm. on Walkertown. Well, it's, it's further from Zesto, okay. so it's right there near uh, uh, Wachovia or Wells Fargo right. Bank, the CVS. There's only one. There's not a hardware store in East Winston. Now, I live on Robin Hood Road within a circumference of five miles at Three Harris Teeters, a food line, a Lowe's, a Whole Fresh Food, and Fresh Market. Yep. Just within a five mile radius. So, until some of those things are changed and addressed, and we talk about it, and it's another thing for us to have a conversation, and we can end this, and you can say, man, that was a great conversation. I enjoyed doing that. But until it moves from here to your heart, where you have a conscience, that you're moved to actually do something, it's going to remain the same. I.e., when the conversation was had about building um, the new school building in East Winston, there was a lot of pushback, if you can recall, because that's across 52. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a fear of going over to Winston-Salem State with some people, for some people, because that's in East Winston. And I've and talked about that on the show, man. I, I, I can't believe it. I grew up... I gra I've got a degree from there now. I went there in 2012 to 2014. Right. Some of the beautiful campuses I've seen, why was I not smart enough to cross that? Well, it's, it's perceptions. Um, it's lack of contact with people to go over to find out. You know, I worked at Winston-Salem State for, I was on the board there for um, eight years, and I served as chair of the board of trustees for two of those years. And then after I left Intergon, GMAC, I worked there for a couple of years, and one of the things that um, I started there was a campus tour, and so we would invite people outside in the community that we wanted to engage with Winston Salem State to come over. We would talk some about the school, but then we would take them on a tour of the campus and to other parts of it, and almost to a person, people would say, I didn't know that. I didn't know this, and now the reason for that is they've never taken the time or they've had a negative perception of coming across 52, and therefore they don't know. And so that perception frames how you feel about something. And until you have that personal experience, you just go on what someone has to share with you. So there's a point where we have to break down some of those things, and you have to get out of your comfort zone um, and try something else. For a person who's African-American, I live in multiple worlds and roles. As someone who isn't, you don't have to think about that. And you know, so it's I become a part of your daily routine to get outside of it. My first day in class at Winston-Salem State, I learned something that I had never thought of. When I look at you, I'm supposed to be colorblind is what I had been taught all my life. And, and that's not true. If you don't see color, then something's wrong. Something's wrong. What I found out is, is John and you, to tell me if you, if you agree with this, Nigel. John, I do want you to see me as African-American or black. I want you to know what I go through. I want you to know how I got here, and I want you to respect that. Exactly. And, and so that changed my whole perspective. I was involved some with um, uh, the um, uh, athletic department, and one of the things that I suggested was, is let's say Livingstone doesn't bring, got it right, see? Livingstone yeah. doesn't bring their band. Well, when the Red Sea of Sound goes out at halftime, the band that comes on before them is, an, is a high school band. West Forsyth comes, Reagan comes, East, wherever it is. And they play a couple songs there, and you give every one of those kids two tickets. And then all of a sudden, we've brought people over 52 that may not have been exposed to the school. And, and we talked about that and it was just like, well, I don't know. They're going to buy, they're going to buy food guys, you know, but it get, you've got to introduce and understand better. I don't, I don't know anything about you other than what we've talked about, but I want to know more and I want to be friends and I want people to think of me as 
no matter what they say, I want them to say John's has a heart in the end. Yeah, and your heart is demonstrated by your actions. And so we have to see what you say you have in your heart outwardly in terms of some of the things that you actually do. And when you don't see those things, as an example, I had a conversation with a dear friend of mine. He's Republican, I'm Democrat, so we can say we're different ends of the spectrum. Right. Uh, we've known each other for 25 years. Uh, he can say anything to me that he wants to. I can say anything to him, and we're still going to like each other when it's over with. One of the specific things, and this has to do with the murder of the young man in Georgia back in February that's just not come to light, and specifically what I mentioned to him in the conversation of the night, I said, now, I'm not asking you this. I'm telling you this. So it's not a question. You have never had to have a conversation with your child to tell them how they must act when they go out at night if they're stopped by the police. Not only have you not had the conversation, you've never had to think about it. You've never left your home getting in your car to go out and ever thought if the police stops me that it's going to be a problem. You have never, ever had that experience. Now, what that experience is for you is privilege because you haven't had to. And because we have those conversations with children and we think about that when we go out, it's not something that you understand because it's not a part of your world until you understand some of those things that you begin to, the scales come off of your eyes and you begin to see in a different way. And if you can see in a different way, you can feel. And if you can feel, if I can get to your heart, it's going to be difficult for you to sleep at night and not do something different. So for most people, it's just a conversation, and then we just go back to our respective places, and consequently, it continues to be the same. Our, our community is big enough yet small enough that we can actually make real change here where you couldn't do it in some other places. Yeah, no, I, um, uh, and I don't know why this does, sometimes my, my computer decides it wants to do something different. Um, so one of the things that uh, you were saying there that really popped into my head was I remember when LeBron James said that, mm -hmm. you know, here's a guy that could buy and sell my whole neighborhood. Right. And, um, you know, and I don't know where you live, but probably yours too, in the sense of things. And he has to have that conversation with his son. Right. When he goes out to drive, uh, you know, I try to do better. I really do. And I think that if we can all try to do better and, and my, my feeling with others is, is I don't know what shoes someone's walking in. So if I'm driving down the road and someone's honking at me to get out of their way, they may be on their way to an emergency. And, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not flipping them off. I mean, you know, it's just, you just try to do better. And right. um, I think this COVID thing is, is really, uh, you know, some people are saying it's bringing us together. I think other people are saying that it's, uh, pulling us apart. Um, both I, and. Huh? I'll say both and. Both, yes. And, and I think that once some of this stuff, uh, once it settles down, I think it's going to probably pull us apart more than it's going to bring us together. Um, right now we have a common thing, but when, when it gets out to, you know, um, I, I think it, it may not, be, I don't think it's going to be race or anything like that. I think it's going to be more socioeconomic is going to really pull people apart. Um, because I think uh, the haves will have and the have nots may may not have any or as much and and it but it's hurting a lot of people and and I think that's one of my last two questions was you know I got to ask you the negative question and then the positive question so the negative question is is how much is COVID going to hurt us well it, it's going to hurt us it's already hurting us and you already see some of the wedge that's being driven now it, it's impacting the African American community more than any place else. Uh, what it is doing is it's exposing what some of us already knew and it's now more apparent to everyone. So right. when you look at the percentages of those who are impacted, it's heavily African-American just across the country. Right. So when you think about, uh, I'm fortunate to have health insurance, but if you don't have it, that's tough, right? Yeah. Many of those who are impacted as well are essential workers. They have to go in some place to work. Many of those have to take public transportation. So you just think about that. We don't have enough tests. We haven't done adequate testing. We've got people that are essential workers. They may not have the insurance that they need. Many are losing jobs. 
Um, so it's, it's just creating this um, now with the push to reopen very quickly. It's your health or your life. You know, uh, I need to work. And if I don't work, I may not get unemployment. But if I do go to work, I may not live. And if I want to live, I don't have money so that I can live. So it's, it's all of those conversations that we really need to have. You know, you have a group of uh, pastors now who are wanting to sue the governor because they say it's their constitutional right to have churches that want to. Well, you can go ahead and have it. If I were going to your church, I wouldn't be there. I mean, it's just, it, it, it really isn't safe yet for people just to go in to cause something that could happen catastrophically worse than it is now later. So those things are happening now. Those conversations are happening. And I think that's going to continue for some time. Uh, I don't know that the fall in terms of sports and those things are going to be where they used to be. And, and whenever it gets, you know, it, it's beyond normal there. There is no normal any longer. Uh, it's, it's beyond normal. And once we get back to it, it's just going to impact so many people because there's some businesses that won't be there. There are jobs that will not come back. And what do you do? It's just sad. I mean, you know, we saw um... – I think Algernon said something about old Winston Social Club. I don't know if they're renaming or if they're coming back a different way or if they're closing. We saw what um, the Hive, um, they've closed. I think they've moved to a different location, actually, and they're going to do something different closer to a, a smaller community. But um, it's, it's just sad. And, you know, did you ever think you'd say, hey, I remember when I used to go down to the gate and re meet my family when they got off the plane. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is one of those changes. I mean, it's going to be... Are we all going to wear masks now when we go out? Uh, are we all, um, you know, will there be sporting events and, and, and you know, things like that? Um, I, I just there's still, there's still people, you know, I was, uh, went to the grocery store today because we were out of everything. Right. Uh, so I have on gloves. I have a mask on. As most of the people who were in the grocery store, and it wasn't crowded, so, you know, there was plenty of space. At the same time, there were people walking around with no mask and no gloves. And I'm thinking, uh, I went by McDonald's to pick up some tea for my wife. Right. The young lady who reached out to take my money had no gloves and no mask. Right. And I said to her, so where's your mask? Oh, well, I accidentally threw it away. I said, you don't accidentally throw it away. I said, now, you aren't practicing social distancing. Your colleague is standing right beside you, and he has no mask and no gloves. So this is serious. Now, she went over and found a mask. He came to the window. I said, so where's your mask? Well, you know, it bothers me when I put it on, I can't breathe. And he holds the mask. I have one of those masks. You can breathe with that mask. It does not restrict you from breathing. I say, you all are not six feet apart. You have no gloves and you do not have a mask. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate it. You're trying to help me out. <clears throat> you know, God bless you. And I went on. But so it's those kinds of things that you think, what are you thinking because it can impact someone else that impacts someone else that has a significant impact on all of us. So there, there are a lot of lessons for us to learn, I think, if we really pay attention that can help us all get over there. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm not sure that we're all paying attention to it because we have other agendas. You know, there's an old saying that says, if you want to go fast, go along, or if you want to go slow, go along. If you want to go fast, go with someone else or something. I know I'll, I'll butcher that, but the point is uh, we need to take it slow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think that uh, based on what's going to happen with the phase one uh, should show us how we, how quickly we go into phase two. And uh, there are a lot of people that are on both sides of the fence. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm considered essential in my job with real estate and I'm, I'm working, but I'm not, working as hard as I would have be if it was, you know, you know, if someone wants to see something, I'm trying to work it out to get them the pictures and things like that. If they still want to see it, then we go. Um, I've got a couple clients that are having, you know, like getting divorced and stuff like that, that I mean, they need a place. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so about two minutes left because I, I, I don't want to keep you much longer, but um, here's my question for you. And it's okay. going to be a long answer for you. I already know this. Where do you want to see our city Winston-Salem go? Well, I would like to see us come together more to have what I call fierce conversations. I, I led a, a group of people in the community several years ago after a situation that happened in 
Baltimore with a young man that was arrested by the police that ended up dying that really just moved me in a particular way. And, and the essence of a fierce conversation, John, is it's one in which you and I enter into and we emerge from slightly different than when we started. And what that means is that you're authentic, uh, that you can share whatever your point of view is, and I'll listen, I can share whatever mine is, and you listen, and when we come out the other side, we're different than the two people who came into it. And that we can honestly and openly put the things that, when addressed, can make a difference on the table and actually address them so we can move it forward. Uh, until we begin to do some of those things, it will just be the same old, same old. And I've said this, there was a civil rights worker who said this a long time ago, it may have been Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So just having the same conversation with the same people and get the same results is a definition of insanity. I don't want to go insane. So for me, it is really having the conversations that are needed, honestly, and addressing them in a meaningful way so we can move it forward. We have a lot of potential, uh, but there are a lot of people who are on the outside looking in that aren't a part of this and don't feel like it's a part of their city. And that's something we have to do to embrace. Uh, we have folk in East Winston who look at what's called Innovation Quarter, and they can never be a part of that, right? On the outskirts of it, you're looking at an area that is becoming gentrified, where Innovation Quarter is, that area was once Black Winston-Salem, where the first mass transit bus system in the country was right here, which was Safe Bus Company which was thriving at one point, and now you have some people on the outskirts looking at this thing that we uh, boast about, rightfully so, as Innovation Quarter, but the skills and what they need to be a part of that, they will never be a part of. And how do we embrace that? Until we begin to eliminate some food deserts where people can't buy fresh vegetables and food, or have more than one grocery store, and have no hardware stores, until we can do some of those things, we just continue to talk. Uh, we say that we are the city of innovation and the arts. We promote it, we tout it, and we are. At the same time, we're leaving out too many people. So there has to be a way for us to embrace the citizens of the community in a holistic way that makes everyone feel that they're a part of it. You're a treasure, man. Oh, I'll thank you for that. I really appreciate you. and. Um, I'm, I'm going to say thanks to everybody for, for watching today. Um, and I, I just, I want people to understand that, you know, the insanity thing has got to stop. I mean, we've got to have real dialogue. And when you said that about your friend, and I mean, I, I don't understand how anybody, politics is one of the weirdest things to me. I can tell you anything. I'll tell you how I feel about anything but that's my opinion. Why, why should it matter? Why should it get you heated up? Why should it affect you in any other way? It's not your opinion. It's mine. And, and, you know, I want to hear what your opinion is. You said you're a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I had Paul Lowe on. I'm voting for Paul Lowe. I think he's hilarious and a great guy and he cares about me and he cares about everybody. Um, and you know, I like to watch Michael Moore films to understand what other people think because it helps broaden my horizons. So, I just, I can't say anything better than what you've said, uh, you know, because you're an expert at, 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 and a writer and all this kind of stuff. All I can say is thank I'm you. Not, I'm not an expert. I'm just, you're, I, you, just you, yeah. I just have an opinion. Uh, sometimes it's a very passionate opinion, but not and a it's a good one. And, and like I said, I think if we all wake up every morning and just try harder, we're going to achieve something one day. So. And we have to get back. You know, I, I know your time is running out. I have a school that I adopted, Ephesus Junior Academy. It's a small Christian, it's a Seventh-day Adventist church that has a school there, first through eighth grade, that I adopted five years ago. There are about 20 students. And for the last five years, I've, we started a book club called Sorry, I'm Booked. And every month during the school year, I purchase a book for each one of those kids that they want and take it over to them, and there have been others in the community who have joined me. My point is, we have to do more of those things, too, where we reach back. Uh, there's a love of reading from them now that when I come, I feel like I'm a rock star when I go because they know when I come, I'm bringing donuts or books. 
and they enjoy it. And so we have to do more of reaching back and giving back and demonstrating to the next generation that's coming up that we can get this done. And if we don't do that, it's just a lost cause. I, I truly believe in a larger sense, coronavirus is just a reset for the earth. And it's I a agree much, with that. It's a much larger story where the earth said, I gave you all a chance and you didn't do it. So we're just going to take some time to clean the air and reset and make you talk to people in different ways. And once we get through with it, we'll let you come back. Well, um, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask you this when, can we have a cup of coffee when this is all over with and sit on we, the bench and talk? We can certainly do that. You're a great guy. I appreciate it. I'm going to stop recording the show here and tell everybody to say thanks for, uh, uh, watching Camel City Chat. Of course, you can listen to us on Spotify and, and Apple Music and, and watch us on YouTube. My guest is Nigel Alston. And Nigel, uh, I've truly appreciated getting to know you. And uh, we'll be back next week with more Camel City Chat. Well, thank you very much for having me, John. Thank you, buddy.